Okay, so welcome. I hope people can hear me. Okay, so welcome, welcome, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our pre-conference webinar. Welcome, we're letting people in. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. Hey, good evening, everyone, and you're very much welcome. We're letting people in. People are still joining. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm looking at the chat. You're very much welcome. So yes, welcome everyone to part two of our pre-conference webinar for the HR Bootcamp Conference. Welcome everyone, and we'll be starting in the next minute or so as we welcome people in. You're very much welcome. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Please, as you come in, let's know where you're joining in from. Good evening. Where are you joining in from? You can pop it in the chat so that we know where you're coming in from. And very much welcome. Who's coming in from the furthest part of town? Where are you joining in from? So I'm quite excited about today because if you were here two weeks ago or you watched the video, um, last time, it was quite an exciting time, Lola and I, and today we have more help, <laughs> extra banter. Elizabeth is joining us today and anyone, oh, good evening. Ah, Chris from Milton Keynes. How is, how is the UK? What's the weather like? Snowing, raining? Good, wonderful. Good, 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 good. Yes, I can see Mwakego, Kem, Didi. You're very much welcome. Good, 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 good. Fantastic. I'm really looking, who's looking forward to today? I mean, the title alone is very, very, <laughs> I mean, just looking at the title is something really exciting. 2025 HR Survival Guide. Who needs a survival guide for 2025? So without um, further ado, I want to wish everyone a good evening from Lagos. Someone says it's snowing. Oh, you said it's snowing in Milton Keynes. Good, wonderful. So today I will just make introductions, tell you a bit about why we're here, and then we just go ahead on to the... Can you hear? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Did someone say they couldn't hear me? <laughs> okay. Right. I, I don't know. I heard someone. So... Can everyone, okay, someone is from Ibadan. Wonderful, welcome. <laughs> someone is asking for a survival guide for December. <laughs> We're talking, okay, Joss. Ah, wonderful, nice, Ijoma. Welcome, okay, you can hear me loud and clear. So let's get into the business. So why are we here? So this is part two. So if you missed the part one, first of all, in fact, when we send out the link you know the the link after this which would have the video recording we will send you the part one which we had two weeks ago and this is the final part of our pre-conference webinar for the hr boots um you know the hr bootcamp conference so without further ado the title for today's webinar is 2025 hr survival guide right but what is the real focus? The focus is critical talent and tech shifts you must embrace now. I mean, we did talk about some of these things at the last webinar where we spoke about, you know, H, you know, trends, what will be trending in 2025 and beyond. But today we are saying these are about survival skills. We're talking about the critical shifts you must embrace now. I mean, it's just, I when we say survival guide, I guess what we're saying is that if you don't embrace these shifts, like last time we talked about trends and you know, trends can be like fads um, and you just jump, you know, they're bandwagons. But today we are saying, look, these talent and tech shifts, if you do not make them, I don't know about 2025, right? So we're focusing on the tech talent and tech shifts that you must embrace now. 
in order to survive. Someone says they want December survival. Okay, no problem. <laughs> this is 2025. So you can manage it now. So with me is Lola Isson, partner EY Nigeria, and Elizabeth Okonji, founder TGL Labs. So like we did, if you remember the last one, very conversational. The slides are really just a guide so that you see the pointers in which we're going to be speaking about. And then we're just having a friendly conversation uh, Lola, Elizabeth, and I, and we will answer questions. The last time we were here, I mean, we had about an hour scheduled, but everyone was still like, you know, looking at the screen and, you know, people were like, ah, oh, it should have been longer. So today we have an hour and a half scheduled. So an hour really for the conversation and 30 minutes for questions and answers. So Lola, it's good to see your face. Elizabeth, I'm not seeing your face. Okay, uh -huh. please put on your video. <laughs> put on your video we're ready for today let me just make sure that we're recording um are we recording just need to yes i see recording yes so be sure yeah we're recording good yeah. so that we can share the video um afterwards so good good so okay let's start so i'm just going to take <laughs> us through <laughs> the agenda but before we before we start fully of course, we're here. This is the pre-conference webinar for the 12th HR Bootcamp Conference coming up on the 3rd and 4th of December. And of course, if you're familiar, this year's theme is Evolve. And the sub-themes are Talent Transformation and Tech Innovation. And if you're not familiar with the HR Bootcamp Conference, it started in 2009. It's basically a platform for reinventing people management practices. This is the 12th edition, but this is the 15th anniversary of the HR Bootcamp Conference. And, you know, like I said, the theme is talent transformation, tech innovation. And we are just providing some of the contents and some of the things that we will be, of course, talking about the key talking points for the webinar. So without the agenda is pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to look at why, why is 2005 so critical? And I'm going to ask Lola, Lola and Elizabeth, me, I'm here to learn as well. So I'm going to be asking you those questions. Don't throw back any question at me. I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, and you're going to tell me why 2025 demands new HR strategies. Why is why is this different from previous years? I want to know. And um, what are we going to look at talent shifts and then we're going to look at the tech shifts, okay? Because last time we looked at the trends, the combination of trends around the HR space. I want to look at the talent shifts and I want to look at the tech trends that we must embrace today. And then, of course, it's not just about knowing what these things are. Action, you know, what do we do? So like actions, practical tips that we can carry away, you know, into our organizations that will make a, a difference in the way we're doing things. Yeah. So I've given you Expo. So what I'm expecting you now is for your cooperation, right? <laughs> okay. And I'm giving you like, if you look at the slides, of course, it's a guide for us. But um, who do I start with? Should I start in alphabetical order? Elizabeth first or Lola? You know, why is 2025 a turning point? Why are we why why should 2025 have a survival guide? Shouldn't there have been survival guide? I mean, we've been surviving since 2020. Why is 2025 different? Over to you, Elizabeth. Ah, okay. I was gonna say I pick Lola to start, but <laughs> okay, thank so... you. <laughs> uh good evening, everybody. Yes, good evening. I would, uh, I would just say every year, every person, every business, every entity has to, you know, you're looking ahead, you're planning. We used to go into New Year resolutions and all of that. Yeah. Now we're coming out of a period where there's been a whole song and dance around digital transformation, tech shifts, um, come out of the pandemic and taking charge of all of that. So this is a new year. What do we do with the time that we've been given as businesses, mm -hmm. as business owners, as yeah. people management specialists on behalf of the organization? Mm -hmm. We have to be thinking about 2025 because this is when a lot of things will culminate. 
Ooh. all okay. the learning, all the fear, all the propaganda in the news, <laughs> all the reports, yeah. WEF, mm. McKinsey, Gartner, everything. What do we do with all this information? I always say that knowledge that's not backed by action is just data. It's information. What do, you, what do you do with it? The fact that you know something means you can do something with what you know. So with all the things that we know, what do we do with it? So we're going into a new year. And this is not the time. I like what Lola said in, in the last one. She's like, we keep asking for a seat at the table when we should be the table. Like you're serving at the pleasure of the organization that your role exists for. What are you doing with that information? So we know that all the shifts that are happening, AI and automation, how do you, many of us are busy this period because we're in one strategy session or the other. Yeah. What are we discussing in this in these sessions? Are we going business as usual and you know going with the budget from finance? and just saying, okay, we need to do L and D. What type of L and D are you doing? Or are you going to sit and just wait for your L and D tool or the appraisal where people score one to five and then you say, okay, they get this merit, whatever it is. 2025 is going to be the decider for a lot of businesses. If you are in mm. this market, we are experiencing things that we did not think we would be experiencing or that we wanted to experience. We are in it. And it is the world over. So Nigeria is not alone. There's a new government coming into the US. There is what's happening in the UK. There's what's happening in Canada. Like any market you can think of is going through some sort of reform pivot that we will see more of. For the function of HR, our job is to help the business look outside from within and figure out where we need to go. So 2025 is pivotal for, for a lot of reasons. If you are thinking you. about, yeah. Yeah, so yes. I hear you say it's pivotal. I mean, because what I hear I, is the one, it's a combination of pre uh, post-COVID, right? All the learning. Well, if, you know, I think we would, we're still figuring it out, but some, there's enough data to say this is it and this is the result of, you know, these type of behaviors or these type of actions, right? So, I mean, we've had 2021, 22, 23, 24. I mean, we have enough, it's, it's a good enough time to say this is a trend or this is what the data is saying and for us to get some serious learning from it. From it. That's what I hear you say. Okay, so Lala, what are your thoughts? Why is 2025 pivotal? Isn't it like any other year? Good evening, everyone. So apologies if I sound a bit muffled. I have a bad cold, but I'll try and make sure I'm clear. So, I mean, I think it's like Elizabeth said, right? We are exiting what you call the valley of depression. As you know, 2020 plunked us in there, everything went up city of a, everything we know or remember about how business should be run happened in that 2020. So climbing out of that valley, as you would most um, corporate strategies, you do five-year strategy, right? This is now that pivotal five-year moment. Then if you even cast your mind on a lot of the surveys and the statistics and the projections around the economy, the data we have up until now is about 2025. So it starts around the skills that are emerging, skills that are in decline, so it's almost like, um, imagine an onion, right? We're peeling off a new layer. The world of work has changed forever, you know? So yeah. anything we did not unlearn is obviously going to swallow up. We'll be swallowed up in the... So those who have failed to adapt clearly yeah. are getting ready to die, as they say, adapt or die. So that's one. I and I think for HR, um, unlike other times or other periods in humanity, this is the first time that we're celebrating self. Yeah. over and beyond your identity as an employee or where you work. So the reemergence of the self would obviously shape a lot of things with respect to what's on offer. Then okay. we now have the obvious economic challenges. A lot of organizations mm -hmm. have had to restructure. So in the last five years, we have seen HR decline in terms of prioritization in organizations. So a lot of people 
maybe you were head of Africa, they've added Middle East to Shiana and God knows what else, but you're essentially now supporting someone somewhere. So the shift mm -hmm. is, uh, I like um, Elizabeth's point around changing from outside in, right? It's, it's, it's that. 2025 is that year where we're going to have to learn a lot of things or we're going to test a lot of the theories that we have built our value propositions around. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I like what you said about the, the fact that even if we had a five-year strategy, like it's over, right? <laughs> so 2025, you're going to, you need a new one. Okay. And if you think about what happened 2019 to 2024, geez, I don't even know if, I mean, whatever strategy you had then, we need new ones from 2025 onwards. I think even that alone is, is pivotal. And I'm sure some countries, I remember we used to have vision. I mean, in Nigeria, we used to have vision 2020. I'm sure some countries might have 2025, I mean, or something like that. But I hear you definitely. So 2025 is another critical year. And if we're having strategy sessions, it should be the five-year one, right? Because it should be what will take us from 2025 to maybe 2030, I guess, because it's maybe because it ends with five as well. It's, it's quite pivotal. Yeah, so definitely. I mean, aside, of course, the still rapid pace of change in technology and change in workforce expectations and globalization, obviously, definitely there are risks. There are also, you know, impending risks. So let's look at some key points, because I said, we're going to look at two talent shifts and we're going to look at tech shifts, okay? So talent shift one, and I want us to speak from, of course, I know Elizabeth, you deal with a lot of tech firms, small and medium-sized businesses, you know, I know that obviously, Lola, you have a lot of experience with, you know, firms that you consult for, in your firm. So this hybrid and remote workforce talent shift one, you know that all businesses cannot obviously work remotely. We've seen the hullabaloo over remote work. There's a big come back to the office thing. We did talk about this at the last webinar, but what we're saying now is adapt or die. Right. So must people adapt to hybrid and remote workforce models? must this happen is this a survival one of those if you don't do it you're on your own and maybe why so i think for me adora it's a question of you must but of course we take into consideration the realities so if i use my reality and i do acknowledge and apologize up front that i will be speaking yeah. from a place of privilege we're yeah. still at home yeah and if I think of myself as a business leader, I have had my most profitable years leading a practice when my people have been at home. So the question is not where the person is. The question is the value system and the currency of engagement in the organization. Where mm -hmm. I work is built around trust on the fact that we don't need to see you to know that you're doing the work, but we've made investments in tech to ensure you account for the work. We've also okay. evolved new methods of keeping you connected with the mothership. We've made mm -hmm. investments on that support, both psychological well-being, safety, and all of that. So there mm -hmm. has to be an investment to be made in that sense. But yes. then I realized that not everyone can be remote. For, for example, our factories still require people to mm -hmm. be there to power the machines. Mm -hmm. But what then will now happen is for individuals caught in that type of employment, your policies around leave will have to be flexible. And mm. a lot of people are doing interesting things. So once upon a time, they tell you for this level is 20 days or not. You now have yeah. a system whereby those who cannot come in are leave banking longer days. So for example, um, you know the laws around how many hours you can do in a week. So they then, and so a lot of those people, for example, are on four day weeks or they work half um, one and a half weeks straight and they get the extra. So the flip side of not being able to go fully remote is that at least you would have some form of hybrid working model. But to advocate for everybody back to the office, you will get transactional employees who are shopping for alternatives that are better. Yeah, yeah, I, I get you. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, we did talk about this last time and we talked about the fact that, yes, it was a trend. However, like, you know, 
it's it's become such an issue. I mean, you can see it in the, the you know the comeback to office is so much. You know, like even firms that had two are saying we're going to do three. Like there's such a strong, you know, push from senior management to come, you know, to go back to either fully on site or more days on site. Um, Elizabeth, what what are your thoughts on this? I mean, which side are you on? I know <laughs> you work with firms that embrace it, but I think one key thing to point out, because we're talking about practical steps, is Lola, you keep emphasizing the fact that it goes with technology investment. So if you're having problems with any form of hybrid, you need to check whether you've made the right investments and put the right systems in place because it cannot work without those systems. I think it's very clear. And Lola, you've made that very clear the last in two seconds, that if you don't put the systems that it requires, you're going to have issues with it. But trust issues is a different type of issue. Yeah. Instead of focusing on the people, the trust element, which I see that quite a lot of line managers are having, they don't trust. Why don't you just put the systems? Don't allow trust work for you. Put in the systems that make it work, right? You understand? Put it in, you know, make people accountable. Do what you need to do so that you don't have to wor worry about trust. You trust your system. That's what I see. So, um, Elizabeth, it would be good to hear yeah. your thoughts on this. Yeah. I personally think that the drive for increased on-site is as a result of the lack of knowledge and experience of the leaders. Lack of what? Sorry, I didn't get Knowledge that. and experience of the leaders. Mm -hmm. So okay. if there's a trust to result continuum where you have, if you're thinking about the um, five dysfunctions of a team from Patrick yeah. M. Lencioni, trust is at the base. If you don't have trust and trust is a function of the systems you put in place and the ability of your leaders to manage in the scenario that they find themselves. So if you're investing in the technology, if you don't have trust and you know that you haven't your people don't have the discipline and you haven't spent time investing in the discipline, putting the yeah. systems in place that build that culture, you will not mm -hmm. have trust. The hybrid remote working is no longer a trend. I think we're shifting from it being a trend to it being a reality mm -hmm. because even in industries where it's not feasible because mm -hmm. of the type of work that they do or mm -hmm. production. Yeah. They are mm. working in an economy where people are enjoying remotes and hybrid work. Mm -hmm. They will want it to. So you can't yeah. put people in bubbles that really don't exist. Mm. There are different ways that hybrid and remote work can be implemented in your organization, whether people have to be, you know, present and working, shift work, increased leave days, you know. Um, some companies have some industries have found ways to make this work from a long time ago, where you can either have one month on, one month off. We know the industry that does this. Yes, two weeks yes. on, two weeks off. It's existed yeah. for the longest time. So how do we get more creative as, a, as HR people in companies yeah. where the question really that management is asking when they're saying we need people back in the office is how do we increase productivity? How do we make sure that work is being done? If people don't mm. know how to lead when they're not seeing people, they will not lead when they're not seeing people. They will need people back mm. in the office. Someone needs to bridge that gap. So I, mm. I think it's possible. I think it's a reality that we can't escape. And we mm. need to just be creative in how we implement it and intentional yeah. for what suits the business. Yeah. Interesting. And, you know, the thing is, like, so many things are happening at the same time. I love uh, your point is... Buttressing, I see Deji's point, Deji Ajibala's point on, we can't talk about investments in tech without addressing the trust and mindset shift required to embrace hybrid. And those that's a very, very pertinent issue because that is the foundation, as you've mentioned, the trust element, the trust. The, if you don't believe that it's a productive way of working, right? There is no tech investment that is going to help you. Well, you know, unless maybe, I don't know, the tech investment is I'm looking at you, maybe it's possible, <laughs> you know, but I, I mean, it, it's it's key. The trust is very key. The systems are also 
very, very important because without those systems, it just it just cannot work because we have talked about the mindset issues on both sides, mindset on the team lead side, but there's also mindset um, issues on the employee side. Employee. Um, you must also accept that this is a way of working. So the shift is is two sided. It's not just leaders that need to 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 trust, you know, their yeah. you know, their employees uh, or you know their, their their associates or workers. However, you need to you yourself. You need to be, need trusted. To be trustworthy. Yeah. <laughs> Because some people also like, and I don't know we've dressed it countless times, their own mindset is that it's a day off. Mm. And it's, yeah. I mean, yes, with quite a number of people, you know, the minute you say working from home, you know, it's, it's literally it's a day off. It's stress though, Adora, that it's not an entitlement. And as I say to people, yes. so obviously for you to build that trust and it works both ways, you can't just yes. say, trust me. It's not a, what you told you. Over time as an employee, you have yes. to have been credible and reliable. So when I wasn't yeah. there by your shoulder, you were doing the work. And <laughs> exactly. when yeah. I was there to tell yeah. you what it was, the work quality yeah. did not help. And it works both ways. So as a company, uh, this mm -hmm. is what you said you would do even when I was not there to hold it over you. So again, that trust yeah. building is key. Yeah. But I think in all of this, even though we're having rich conversations around remote versus hybrid, uh, it does take time to build trust and it can be broken yeah. like any relationship and the things we yes. do or do not do. So yeah. um, one to note, but I always stress that it has to be context-based. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, still, I mean, I think some people are still, I'm not even addressing the firms that can't work remotely because by nature of your work, I mean, we have to go to the venue um, today. I mean, what if they are working remotely? There will be no, in fact, the conference, I mean, even though it's 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 hybrid, virtual, if the hospital or hospitality decides to work remotely, then we don't have anywhere to go in terms of leisure spots or things to do. So there, what I'm concerned about is those companies that could enjoy the benefits of hybrid, but have issues, those companies who are service companies and have not been able to, you know, like enjoy it for some reason, or, or especially reasons like this. And I also want to know your thoughts around companies who obviously, um, I, like in hospitality, who have to be, uh, of course, if you go into a, a, a restaurant, <laughs> you, you want to be served, right? But what, what are your thoughts on the back office staff, like people in HR and finance? Um, should they, ha should those staff work remotely? Or should they all uh, support the frontline staff and work full 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 days on site? What are your thoughts? Because I've heard this argument uh, in several firms on how to what they you know how they work around this. Should everybody come to the office because our core business has to be on site, or can we um, allow some of the you know the back office operates you know work from home? What do you think? Who wants okay. to go first? So my question is, <laughs> yes, these people are people. Like people are people are people. Yeah. At some point, there's equity that has to be implemented for how we work. Yeah. How do you explain to someone when you, these guys can be part of a hybrid work, whatever type of flexible working can exist, yeah? with the right discipline and trust and systems and everything mm -hmm. that's required to make you work for the context that exists. And then some people are, because of their role, back office, they're in HR, they have to be there every day. Um, I think sometimes the question we might need to ask is, if we say that flexible working, so let's not just call it hybrid or remote working. Yeah, sure. It can take different forms. Flexible working is going to be a demand for talent, mm -hmm. for business, and not just for talent, because you can't power a business without people. Your mm -hmm. brand can't go to the market and sell. You, you need people yeah. to do that. When people know that they are excluded from some things just because of the function, I think we'll, that will become a, a high profile function eventually. You will not have enough people being in there. You will have to pay them whatever, for the few people who remain, and then eventually you will have to make them work hybrid because 
the scarcity, the demand for them will, yeah. will fix the supply. Anyway, um, I think if you are implementing remote, I don't think it's a one paintbrush for every role in a business. I've seen it work in different organizations throughout my career where we've experimented with different things. We know that not every, we can't say this is how we operate as a business, but there are some functions that can operate a different type of flexible working that mm -hmm. suits their role. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm, I've worked in service non-tech organizations where they're like, we're seven people, they're working every day. How do you want us to do the hybrid work? What it calls for is what is the advantage? How do we take and expand, explore the advantage so that we can expand it? Making sure that the right guardrails are in place for work to happen in the way that benefits the organization. Lola was talking about her business being more profitable in, in the year where they've not gone back to work, to the office. It's just reconstituting what office means. Like, where are you working from? I'm working from my office is in my room. As long as I saw that work is work, if the tools, factory, whatever you need to do is there, do you have to be there every day of the week and then you have 15 or 18 days leave? It's just the construct of it. When we have our minds around it, we'll be more creative in the solutions that we bring to wrapped around the context for the business. It is possible to have um, flexible working in every industry. That's my own. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the, I mean, let's just move on to the next trend. And I think this is also one that we spoke about, but um, we need to address it in terms of, so that's the talent shift too. Let's do, let's do that. Something we talked about, the skill-based hiring over roles, yeah? So the fact that we must embrace skill-based hiring for greater agility. I mean, last time when we spoke about it, we talked about, I mean, I know I gave the example about job descriptions um, and talking about how the focus needs to really not be a description of the activities, but the skills required. And we did speak at length about how much skills need to be the focus of hiring as opposed to degrees or certifications or whatever. We would need to know that, look, what skills do you have? And we would even need to rewrite our job descriptions to skills descriptions so that, you know, people are very, very clear on what they need to do. OK, so can we explain the, you know, this shift in reality? How? Because some people are on this call and they're not really sure. How am I, how am I going to implement skill based hiring? What these guys, what are we talking about when we say skill based hiring over roles? So explaining the shift towards hiring based on skills rather than job titles. Yeah, so the era of job titles, how, how does this work in reality, Lola? So it's uh, multi-layered, but if you reflect on what is even happening in a lot of service organizations, uh, once upon a time, you meet someone and they say, oh, I'm a general manager, I'm a senior manager, but I don't know what that means. That's just a conversation yeah. you're having with HR yeah. at the end of the month. Yeah. So yeah. now service organizations are moving towards people bearing titles that tell what they do and what they contribute to the yes. organization. So that's on the level of the psychological association with what you bring on board and not how senior yeah. or junior you are. Then let's yeah. take it yeah. into yeah. the context of demand and supply. So a few months ago, my colleagues and I were mulling over data from MBS and some other sites around what percentage of the Nigerian labor force is actually ready for work. And you know, in Nigeria, we still favor degrees. And when we looked at sort of the numbers, those who hold like at least HND and up, so I haven't gone through what we consider full degrees, it's just about 6 million. And considering our wow. population, that's very tiny. So we say we're young, we're young, we're young. But you have to ask yourself in that use, what is the talent ready and available for work? That then tells you mm -hmm. the enormity of the problem. So it is mm -hmm. not enough. So you don't have access or availability of the critical talent you need. So you might as well be engaging people on the basis of, okay, what can you do for me? Who did that? And then that determines what I pay, which is why it makes sense when you reflect on the stats yeah. done by a few people saying that in just a few short years, only 43% of the working population would hold yeah. full-time jobs. 
Because at the end of the day, there will be such a demand that why do I have to sit down with one company when I can actually be HR manager to 10 companies in that group? I just would ring fence what I can or cannot do with NDA. And it's a mindset we have to accept because now, I mean, think about it. Yeah. You see a nice outfit. You don't think about ditching your tailor in a second yeah. because the yeah. person, oh, that's a nice, who made it? You go to the person until the person, you know, starts misbehaving, you move on to the next. And that's exactly how it works with skill base. And that's what they'll tell you that, look, most roles, yes, do all the recruitment you like, do all the whatever you like, but 80% of roles still get filled by word of mouth. And mm -hmm. that's just the reality. And then we had an interesting um, reference last on part one, where we said, if I do something once every month mm -hmm. for 20 years, and yeah. I do it every day for one year, who has mm -hmm. more experience? It's the person who does it one year. So we are now looking for people on the just on the basis of the breadth or the depth of experience yeah. and not the years of experience. And that's why we need to disabuse yeah, right. the details in our yeah. JDs around 100 years experience qualification. What exactly do those mean? So that's some I, of the areas we would see. And you know the thing, it's quite interesting you say this, but because it's not today this started, but I think the point we're trying to make is that it's now become critical. I remember when I worked at InterSwitch, do you know why I got that job? Because they needed to develop a competency framework. I think apart from, I mean, a couple of things, maybe referral, but... Honestly, that was what the MD wanted at that time. And on a, I'm not trying to be funny, but there were like three people in Nigeria who could design a competency framework. Like, you know, you could count the, it, is the, it was the skill. Yeah. But it was, you know, not a lot of people had it at the time. So, I mean, that is, of course, it's a long time ago, but that's an example of hiring for skill. Like you need something done and you're looking out for people who have the skill to do that thing, okay? Because you want to do digital, like some, there'll be some people hired now because of analytics. There'll be some people hired now because of digital transformation experience. Mm -hmm. Because they were able to, you know- um, Demonstrate yeah. and Demo as they yes. say, they showed yes. they are working. So the yes. evidence exists. That's it. No, and you're someone right. going to hire somebody, uh, uh, see, you know, someone is going to hire someone because you, your, the, the firm they work for went through a digital transformation and they were and part they of that. It. Yes. No, you're it. right. So it would even challenge some things around yeah. even data governance. Because, you know, all of us now, our letters say, yeah. when you work for me, whatever it is you do, you it belongs to me. And I don't want you to talk about it, all those confidentiality and things. Yes. But if we follow the restraint of trade mindset, you can't prevent a man from eating with what he knows. So the way our series will evolve is they'll become yeah. like a model's lookbook. This is what I did. And you know, yeah. evidence there. And if you didn't do well, then you don't get the job. So that's yeah. like where we will move. And then in the era of rising costs, a lot yeah. of roles automatically will no longer be, it will no longer be sustainable to be full-time. And devs is one area. I tell people it's not sustainable trying to hold down a dev. The person needs yeah. to do, to get better. The earning power is directly tied to how much experience and how many problems they solve. So stop yeah. changing your organizational yeah. model because you want to keep your yeah. tech talent. And back to Elizabeth's point around equity, you want to satisfy the developers, but every other person is unhappy. So we have to understand why you're doing what. But for some skills base, it's not worth it trying to do full time. You can't win that battle. Yeah. And I like what you said about the fact that job titles would start reflecting what people do, right? And I think that's why. <laughs> You've seen all these fancy HR titles too, as well. You know, I mean, there are quite a number of them. You know, I, I've even seen, I know some firms have even people taking care of remote workers, you know, remote work um, manager. I've seen that role as well. Um, of course, you know, we're seeing lots of people and culture that's quite common in our space, right? Um, yes, it was a couple of days ago, I had a, a, sh a radio. I, you know, I was invited to speak on radio and I got a content creator. I don't know if anyone saw those video. My dear, someone recommended me a content creator. I never knew in my life that I will hire a content creator. So there are people, that's their work. Who, so I was like, the, 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 the you know, um, oh, I, I think I can speak anyway. So they were like, oh, please record the session so that we can share. And I was like, record the session before someone comes with their camera. Then I just remembered about two weeks ago, a friend told me that, you know, I saw a video 
that she, you know, on posted on social media. And I was like, I was just wondering, ah, you were the one walking and doing all that stuff. Who was following you around? She said, oh, she hired a content creator. Ah. My dad, I was walking to my mind. They said I should record the session. I was like, ah, content creator, please give me a number. So as I went there, the person followed me back. So I was like, ah, I think I need to, you know, <laughs> this is something I will happily, you know, do. But it's it's so different, you know, obviously even from the job title, content creator, I mean, a couple of years, there will be no such human. But I can just imagine the number of firms that would need that because people are posting a lot on social media, brand awareness, you know, personal branding to company branding. You want to showcase, you're going to hire a content creator because, and this is not social media manager, this is content creator. So these are roles that are, you know, they're so new. And then another question is now, we're talking about skill-based hiring. I think we're talking about a couple of things here. That kind of person now, they're not going to be your staff. They don't want a full-time job. They have a lot of people. They're happily working for a lot of people. And we're going to have to accept those kind of workers in the workplace. That, that for me, is something that people have to embrace. We've talked about it. You do not have to buy all your talents. Some people you will borrow. There may have been roles which were full-time, but you have to get to the point where even some of those roles that you thought were so critical, you're going to hire them fractionally not as full-time workers. You'll be shocked. So I think, you know, this is quite an interest. Someone was talking to me yesterday and I was like, um, oh, they need something. And I said, Adora, you're too expensive. I said, you're too expensive to hire. I said, you can hire, I can be your fractional CHRO. I don't have to work full-time. I said, hire me fractional. And I know Elizabeth and I'm coming to you. You do a lot of fractional roles. Mm -hmm. So and, and it's a different way of working. People are not, they don't realize it's, it's, it's different. You can be, I can be the CHRO of five firms. Mm -hmm. You understand? Fractional. All of them pay me what pay me what you paid that other person, but it's one day, <laughs> or it's half a day a week I'm giving you because that's where your money reach, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But but I mean I, I think the whole point is it's just a different way of working and it's real. It's not you know. And I've had quite a number and like I, so Elizabeth, I'm coming to you on that. Because these are things that we need to accept. They are fractional C-suites people. They are fractional all sorts. You, you can borrow people and people are happy to work, you know, in those kind of roles. So Elizabeth, I'm, I'm yeah. to you on this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you for exposing me. Uh, I'm actually exposing you, right? Officer. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fractional chief people officer, CHR, whatever, to about yeah. three companies um, yeah. at the moment running my own company then consulting and advising and all of that yeah, so yeah. It, it is i call it the rise of the fractional um about three to five years ago i didn't even know what the term fractional as an employment term meant mm -hmm. um and and someone like liking it to like they're different communities if you just google fractional x yeah. you will see there are many fractional communities Mm -hmm. globally we don't yeah. have so much here um and someone compared it to you know um commoditizing expensive talent talent that yeah. doesn't want to be you, you probably don't have enough work yeah. or enough variety of work to engage this thing. yes their mm. out their capacity sort of is broader than what obtains in your business they love mm -hmm. your business probably for the culture for the impact it's going to make. But mm -hmm. if they keep at that small pocket of function that they have, they can mm -hmm. go into like muscle atrophy. You can get them disengaged because they're just like, I don't feel utilized. And we used to yeah. hear this a lot with top talents. Talent operating in the top 1% space will easily get feel underutilized. Whether they are is a different thing. Yes. Now, the world is getting to the point where, and and Lila mentioned for the tech people, you can't. We spent so many years trying to cage them, trying to make them calm, trying to make them, you know, just work in the corporate world. But this guy needs to do diverse things, even if he's a data scientist. The your set of data that your company is producing is not enough for the knowledge that he needs to be able to brag about in his community. 
Yeah, and right. that's the currency that that person, it's not even about all the time what you are paying them because you are a means to an end, basically. Yeah, unless you're doing something that's crazy or they started the company, you are a means to an end. They are using it to grow their reputation, increase their earning capacity. And with growing their reputation, they will increase their earning capacity. So if you want to yeah. keep your te tech talent, you might have to adapt to this rise of the fractional. And it's, it's called the gig economy. Yeah. Yeah. There are businesses that are leveraging, well, my business is leveraging the gig economy because there are people who are working, but they're not, they're like, yeah, I'm working here, but there are use cases. There are yeah. examples, there are scenarios that I can't be exposed to. I want to go do this project for two weeks, four hours yeah. a week mm -hmm. in the FMCG, but I'm a tech talent. I'm, I've been in tech all my life. I want to mm -hmm. hear what this, what it's about. And they get the opportunity to do the project, get their money, they move. If we find ways to be sort of ethical and progressive about this, we will, yeah. we can um, sort of optimize this and use it with, for employee engagement. That's it. This might be way ahead of its time, but I think that there, there, there are ways that we can. And skills, skills, skills based employment is really about what can you do. It's not about what title did they give you, because somebody can mm -hmm. be bearing the title talent management, but all they were doing is just talent acquisition. And yes, talent management I, to me yeah. might mean something a whole lot more scientific. Like, mm -hmm. let's be building all the competency frameworks. Come and use AI to do something. Be the person who's setting the talent management strategy, who's telling us where we should, what type of people will succeed here in the next five years. Mm -hmm. But the person has talent management. So it's no longer about job titles, about what can you do? Show your workings. Like, um, Show your workings. <clears throat> Yeah. And I think that if you, I mean, just going by what we just said um, here around skills, it's inevitable. It's something that, and you did say about top talents getting, usually the best of the talent, they, they will get bored. They'll be very good at certain things and there'll be some things that they just don't want to do. And that's why we would have to look at the way jobs are designed you know, which is why somebody can say, all I'm doing is content creating. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Just editing videos or stuff. Yeah. And even in the HR space, and somebody says, oh, this is all I want to do. I, I just want to specialize in this area. And the person is really, really good at that area. And you'd hire them yeah. for that because yeah. that is the skill set, right? And you, you don't want that. You don't even need them to do anything else, but you just want, you want to know that that thing that they're doing for you, they're doing it excellently it well. Very well. Yeah. Yeah. Greatly. Yeah. yeah. And this is a mindset shift because some of, a lot of jobs, when you look at job descriptions and you look at everything in the job description, you know that that job is not designed well. The yes. person can be good at all those everything things. Everything's inside. Right? Yeah. It's quite broad. <laughs> and that's why at the end, they will add and any other. <laughs> any other. <laughs> So that yeah, Jack of all trade can, master none. Yeah, yeah, so that they can put some more in that job. But we're going to yeah. see a shift, right? Definitely. So you know, so this is definitely one that we need to really look out for skill based hiring. So it's good. I mean, somebody said in the chat, Uberizing capacity. I I like that. That's a the, using the word Uber Uberizing. Uber, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. That's yes. it. That's, that's a good one, definitely. So let's look at the. Next shift. So let's now move to the tech shifts, right? So we've addressed two key talent shifts. Yeah. And now let's look at the tech shifts. So of course, all of this year, in fact, I went, when I went to the, you know, rental today, it was an AI conference that they were having at the venue there. And of course, a couple of, I mean, the event I went to in Ghana, the HR conference I went to in Ghana, you know, the big part of the theme was AI and automation. So, but now we're saying it's not just a trend, right? We must embrace this. If we didn't embrace it, uh, you know, 2020, 2024, why? Like, why can't I get away with? I've not even done tech. So why, should, well, how can I move? I've not digitized. So how am I going to move to AI? 
I want to hear your your thoughts. You know, what are the maybe we can convince people? What are the key era areas that I mean we talked about this last time in terms of recruitment? You know, how AI is transforming recruitment. Uh, you know, performance evaluations, employee engagement. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, true sentiment analysis that when AI is checking your emails anyway, and it's it, it can tell you people's perceptions and feelings before you even do that engagement survey that's what firms are you know using uh you, they're using what well, they call it sentiment analysis right so what tell me why must this be a now 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 and you know do you have any stories what's happening anyone using it any use cases that you can enlighten us on i'm um, lola over to you so i think ai is one of those things you know what they say that nothing can stop an idea whose time has come and AI is exactly that. So yeah. you don't get a chance to not be aware of it. So if you remember back in the day, one of the greatest challenges for, or one of the greatest things HR people got accused of was the fact that we're very reactive and we hide behind our policies. So yes. reactionary meant you wait for it to happen, then you go, the policy says, but everything that is happening with the shifts in humanity is challenging that. So if you're truly going to be forward thinking, the ability of AI to give you opportunities to do generative insights or predictive insights obviously mm -hmm. would put you ahead of your game. Um, mm -hmm. You might have heard me talk about how I think we need to revisit what Buka is because disruption is important for progress. And for mm -hmm. me, instead of the A being ambiguous, the A is anticipate. So mm -hmm. AI is actually not new. We had a very long time to move yeah. towards it. But it's not mm -hmm. one of those things that you truly cannot function without it, which mm -hmm. is why when I had said in some fora that um, any HR that I thought, I think it was about 2018 or so, and I said, looking about three odd short years, um, most HR people would not have a job. And it was so controversial saying that at an HR event, right? And I've said it a few times. But the truth is, can you think of going into a role now and you don't have beyond digital skills, you can't even talk about how nobody's gonna ask you if you can use an ATS, for example, if you're going in for a talent management role. So you can't be saying, I want to go and learn it, because this is gonna cut down the time to do the work faster. You can't be thinking about going into a role for employee engagement, and you're not talking about how the data that exists everywhere. And there's a plethora of data in organizations. We talked about sentiment analysis from even checking your emails. You can't yeah. check all of those things. So what exactly would you be doing? And I mean, I have a funny experience, which interestingly happened before COVID and all of that, just so that AI has been around. So we have this very interesting tool that we use for uh, to manage our CRM, client relationship management. So what it does is the tool comes through. So maybe I select a particular client. The tool will come through, and I'm talking about something we're using as of 2019, by the way. This is before COVID. So it's not so, so AI has been around. It's just that now it's really mainstream. Yeah. So the tool comes through all emails, blah, 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 whatever it is going to that client. And then it gives you a relationship map. I know how wow. everybody can go to an event and say, yeah, I know this, I know this. They know me. I'm a big boy. I'm a, but at the end of the day, it is who they're calling or who they recognize that owns the relationship. So one day yeah. I decided to be troublesome and I ran, I used the tool and I ran it on that client. And it came out that the person with the strongest relationship was a senior associate. So you see, that is using data. To, and for those who understand how consulting works, a senior yes. associate is next level, level two. So if that client, that's supposed to be a very big client, the senior associate. So you know what that means is, obviously that is data to go back to your partners and all to say, you guys are not doing your work. You're not engaging with the clients enough. So those kind of generative insights are the things AI will do. So today, for example, why are mm. you waiting for people to leave when AI can tell you who is likely to, to leave. leave based yeah. on analyzing data so that you can have the stay interviews very early on? So it's yeah. like how all of us went and learned typing with the bootleg versions of typing to talk. So we're not finger typing. Everyone just needs to get on board and learn AI, one AI technique in one way or the other. As I always say, mm -hmm. our next career plan as HR people is to become data scientists because it's yeah. inside you're selling. Nobody's interested in your policy. Why do I yeah. need that policy? Why do I need to adjust it? Why are you saying remote work? What is the data telling me? And AI is that power and that tool and it will cut short yeah. um, time to plan. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just for decision making, the power in decision making. I remember a client that used 
um, AI on their uh, their what's the riders? Yeah, so this this clients is in Nigeria, and um, they got all the data on their riders. You know everything. You know name, age, accidents, all everything, and with that data, they were able to uh, analyze high performance. You know, so what are the the what 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 are the characteristics of people less likely to have accidents? Because you know that when it comes to um, riders uh, dis dispatch, you know that accidents is like your worst nightmare. Because if they have an accident, of course, it's a health challenge, it's an insurance challenge. You know, life is involved, so it's a big one. So imagine, and they use because they had collated so much data from all the you know the the, the rides. And they were able to use it to predict the profile of the person least likely to have an accident. And they, what, what did they use this for? To, for recruitment. So they could recruit better. Okay. So they use the insights to guide future recruitment. And it's the same way you say, of course, you can predict who is likely to leave based on the profiles of, if you have enough data, you look at all the you know, the profile, all the data you have of all the people who have left, you will find some trend there and that can help you. So I think recruitment has always been a very great use case for AI. And I know that um, even at the most basic level for us in HR, at least even if it's just to help you with policies, and start HR help desk. I think that goes a long way in terms of the cost savings you can get with the most basic level of AI, which is answering your routine HR questions. I think we even need to start there, right? With just the most basic, which is the bots and the frequently asked questions type of thing. If we can even start there, I think it will, it will, it will go a long way. Um, Elizabeth, do you have anything on on that? Yeah, I think with AI and automating, um, sometimes running with the trend or running to the trend, just so they are not left behind, sometimes makes us go use the trend for things that don't serve. So what I would say is solution seeking, like what problem are you trying to solve? If we had, if we had over the years developed the skills as HR people of solution seeking for our businesses, for mm. profitability, for we would not need anybody to tell us about using something to help us get there faster. Yeah. The thing we're seeing now is we're having to do both at the same time. We're, we're having to seek solutions for business problems, not policies, not about people, not about not wanting to set yeah. precedent. I, that term is very annoying. But it's not about all of that, but why? And when you do this, so what? We're not answering the so what question. We're just maybe more conscious about rolling out initiatives that are people driven, not knowing yeah. that people driven initiatives are supposed to be business drivers. We need more practice with that mindset as HR people. If we had that mindset, we would be leveraging and jumping on any trend that helps us do this better. Yeah. AI and automation is that. We cannot escape it. The world, it's an idea that its time has come. Um, yeah. We've been using it, by the way. You auto complete on your phone. What was that? That was AI. That was the, AI. That was AI. Banks that are trying to decide um, who to lend to with data, just how you spend. And then they figure out what your score is. That's AI. People are putting yeah. in data and they're trying to determine things out of it, but they're doing it in critical mass with the help of artificial intelligence. That's yeah. why. Or HR, all... if you're exactly oh, if you are yeah. if you're figuring out, if you're trying to solve a problem, I'll give you an example. There were many years ago, before AI became a thing, I don't even think I knew what AI was. I just knew that there were some people that could help us figure this thing out. But many years ago, we we were in this um bind of where to go find people. Yeah, we found out that the two ones and the first classes of this world were not giving us the results. They weren't coming in with it. Like you had to invest a lot more in consequence management with 
these guys in this particular company that I was in. So it wasn't about the category of your degree. We yeah. then started, but there were a bunch of people that even if they go through a management training program, there were just some people who will come out and all the time. And one of my team says, ah, it's from this university. I won't call the name of the university. It's from this mm -hmm. university. And I'm like, mm, okay, let's go and scan everyone who's come from this university. What do they have? Do they perform like these people? Let's see, majority of them did. And then, so let's not just then go and make our hiring just go and hire from that university because that's what we we'll typically do as HR people. Yeah. But let's mm -hmm. go find, <laughs> I'm fashion, I'm not there. Let's go find what is the difference? Like what are the skills that are differentiating these people? Mm -hmm. And we had to use data, like get creative. Is it about how they show up for work? Is it how they yeah. lead? Is it what their leaders are saying about them in 360? Mm -hmm. What are yeah. the things, the behavioral things that differentiate these people? Yes, and then yes. when we got this data, we asked the IT people, I know then the tech people would be like, yeah, disturbing us, HR. What's HR doing with this one? You know, HR, have you finished payroll or have you done all the regular things that they'll say? And we're just like, just help us put the data in. And then we found, we went with these behaviors, like we had brought out these behaviors and we said, okay, let's put everybody in here and let's go find the people that are demonstrating these behaviors to be largely consistently. We were looking for minimum of six months of consistent feedback of these micro behaviors. Yeah, it, it, it takes work. And then we found them and then we could, we started trying to think, okay, how did we hire these people? Some of them came through referrals, word of mouth, because they've done something, they've shown working somewhere. It's, not, it's no longer a job title they had before, but what did they do? Yeah. And they got in. So we started testing this good people, no good people theory. Yeah. And it was no longer yeah. just about theory. It was about, okay, for the people who demonstrated is that it, they, were, they didn't come through a referral, we put them in a focus group and started asking them questions. So what was the thing that helped you? This thing helped us streamline our hiring strategy for next year. And we put in a, a should I say, like a hiring criteria for if they finish at the end of their probationary period, what do they score? And at the end of that year, do they end up in our top percentile? Yeah. And everyone that we use this data that's farmed with artificial intelligence with the help of the tech team was ending up in the in the top criteria. And they were not your two ones. They were mm. mostly not your two ones and all of that. So it is what problem are you trying to solve? And are you ready to do the work? We are no yeah. longer going to be arguing about whether we adopt. I was in a conference where I was asking, how do we find, some people are writing their CVs now with the help of AI. And how do we fish them out? And I'm like, that should not be your problem anymore yeah. about whether they're writing. Their, because now we're looking at the job titles. We're no longer, if we're focused on skill-based hiring, it shouldn't matter whether they're writing their, their CVs with the help of it. AI. In fact, you should want them to write it with AI. So you know at least they can as well. Did they do it well? And that yeah. can be <laughs> so uh, yeah. anyway, I think we are in it is how yeah. do we prepare ourselves yeah. to use it well? Is the use case of AI that yeah. will set us apart and not whether yeah. we use this, how we use it. Yeah. yeah, I like the points you make and it's interesting because at least Yes, I mean, of course, if you hire now, you you would notice a lot of AI usage in it. I mean, in the, back in the days, one of my favorite assessment methods were essays. But obviously, you know what has happened to that then. Um, now people use AI to write their essays. But, you know, the thing about it is what's even more annoying than using AI is not using AI well. well. So, <laughs> so you still get found out. Yes. that you used AI, but, and you didn't even use it well. So it's still going to show because I, I feel like, I mean, I know that AI and anything is, it's an augmented intelligence, right? It should make it should you, be. yeah, if you're fast, it makes you faster. If you're, you know, it, it just instigates or well, at least it adds to what's already there. But one of the worst things you can do is not use it well. Like, you know, direct the lack of skill to that as well, because AI will make you look really, really like 
you know, yes. it will make it look worse than it is. Yes. You understand? Yes. Because it will be so clear that this was not, um, yes. it doesn't fit. And you, we all know about AI and its hallucinations. So yes. if it takes you on the wrong path, it will take you so far. And when you yes. present that as your work, you're just going to look like you didn't even know what you were doing at all. So definitely, I mean, that's one. So that's talent um, tech shift one. Let's look at two. So we talked about, and I know that at the conference, one of the masterclasses around um, AI and using at least, you know, using chatbots and using AI generally to improve your HR processes. And I think this is one that we should definitely be looking out for, because like I said, there's different levels in which we can actually start to implement this in our businesses and our processes. Um, I, this is one that has been around and I know Lola already mentioned about us being data scientists. We can already see it in the types of jobs that obviously exist now. There's a lot of data sciences, data analysis. These were roles that, gosh, maybe five years ago, you would not see them as key jobs. And they're not just jobs, they're skill-based jobs. Because when you see data analysts, it's not just describing the role, I'm, you know, it is describing the skill as well. And I, I guess this, you can see how this all intertwines, the skill-based hiring and the skill sets that are actually required. So data-driven decision is one that has been around for a while, making data-driven decisions. If you've not embraced it, what we're saying now is that this is a shift that you have to make for 2025. Um, why? May, you know, maybe Lola, can you go first? Why? Why would this be different? So you know how they say data is the new oil. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the challenges that have been or what HR people frequently get accused of, is the fact that our approach to issues is based on qualitative. Okay, our people are not happy. Mm -hmm. Let's increase their salary. But why are they not happy? What is the why? And so the why points you to how you go about getting the information to support the proposition. And that's why there's that talk around HR struggles because it doesn't understand the language of business. Now mm -hmm. interface that with very harsh economic climates, like everyone's going through globally. No one's going to take you serious if you're saying that people are not happy. We too, employer, we're not happy. So data <laughs> allows you quickly yeah. cut through the clutter and project reliable information based on the data for decision making. That's a skill set that we all need to get, right? Because what becomes, there's data everywhere. Every day you're living, you're generating data. But how are you able to differentiate between what is useful and what is needed to project your point of view? It's your ability yeah. to actually hone your data science skills. I tell yeah. my colleagues, for example, that what we do as management consultants, we're like actors. I go to a client, yeah. the client tells me I have a problem. Okay, so I have to look at what the client is saying. And then I will curate something that allows you then follow me through and then I get to a landing. Without data, you can't work in a logical or sequential manner. So all of us becoming data scientists means that beyond the qualitative insights around we feel, we know, which is great. Take mm -hmm. the pain of understanding the linkages or the connections between the information that is available. So yeah. people are, so for example, one good study that is interesting that we haven't done anything about it in Nigeria is the fact that if you look at most women who have risen to the pinnacle of their careers. And okay, this could be a bit of a generalization, but I'll explain what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Stats are showing that for certain careers, when you are getting ready to appoint women, that period coincides with when they start having children and getting married. So naturally, you know the decisions that will be made. We'll take the one yeah. of family, which explains yeah. why in certain positions or certain careers, you don't actually have women at the top. But we haven't quite evolved means to say, okay, what is the conversation we need to be at? Yeah, it's great yeah. to track how many women are sitting on boards. That's nice. But the difficult conversation is, what is the shape and form of our human capital if we're not using data to drive studies like this? So it's those kind of things you can do with data and the fact that funds are hard to come by and they're competing interests for funds. So the only way we can be taken seriously as HR practitioners is if we understand how data drives the decisions we're going to be making. And quick story, when I was in industry, as you know, I had a short stint in industry. It coincided with the period when they were repairing Third Mainland Bridge. And this was 2012. 
and a lot of people were saying now what do we do blah 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 so i went to my ceo and i said i want us to come into work early and close an hour early and he looked at me how would that work how people renew this how do that and i said okay hold up i got my colleagues at the time to start tracking consumption of panadol extra on the first aid box so just to show you where data can come from I now got people to start tracking leave days, sick leave days. So, you know, the sick leave you take without having to bring a doctor's note. So by the time I had all of those together, it was clear. And then, of course, our cars were fixing brain boxes more. Because by the time the driver drives, sits in traffic and takes people to Korodu, it's too late to bring the bus back. And so they're packing these buses in wherever it is they stay or conniving with people to steal the brain boxes. So when I calculated the cost of yeah. everything. It was a no-brainer. That decision sailed without going through. And for that period, yeah. that company was known. So eventually, other people caught on to say, come in early, resume later, or resume early, go earlier. We mm -hmm. were the one of the first to do it. And it had such a significant impact on well-being and just generally all of those things. So the point is, data can come from anywhere. But if you're not schooled in what it is to look for insight, you won't know what to do with it, even though it's in front of you. Yeah, I I think that's that's a very interesting one, and it's it's. I remember when you know um years ago in my early HR career, I remember one of the biggest goofs I ever made to my MV was to say staff were not happy. And you know the question he just threw it and he just said which staff, and I couldn't answer. Right, I just felt so like I was like. You know, and maybe it was a couple of people had come to talk to me. You know how staff, of course now, a couple of employees had come to grumble. And then I went to the CEO and I said, staff are not happy. Like, hey, yeah, okay. Good one, Adora. Which staff? I couldn't even say anything. I, I think that was the last time I ever made that type of sweeping statement without data, you know, because you just, you lose credibility. Um, when you're not able to back your your initiatives, and that's why they keep getting rejected, right? You you lose credibility, right? How can you tell me? Even now, I mean, like we as humans, we also tend to exaggerate things. You know, people will tell you, um, even you talk to your sales team or you talk to even people in your team, they'll they'll tell you the same thing. They'll tell you, ah, uh, uh, most people like most. By the time I ask, okay, please, you said most, how many? They say, okay, actually, three people. I said, is that most? You know, because whether, whether we like it or not, you we really have to work with facts. We have to, because it just makes you more credible in every way. Um, and at the end of the day, you can make, of course, decisions that ho hopefully are much better. I mean, when we're talking about data-driven decisions, I mean, that was something I learned I'm happy it was a long time ago, but I mean, when it happened then, gosh, I can't, I will never forget that one. Yes. Um, let's look at the next, I think it's the, so this is, I mean, we've talked about AI in terms of tech shifts and now we're talking about data-driven decisions. So let's look at, you know, key actions, you know, what can HR professionals, not just leaders really, what can we do? What should people, what should be in people's action plans right so of course we can summarize but you know and i'd like to hear what you um lola and i'd li like to hear what you elizabeth think we should be adding because people want to know what do i go away with what are concrete steps i can take and if we were to summarize it of course starting with the first shift that we ask people embrace right so a couple of shifts upskilling of course i think this is something that we flogged um, not just about, you know, your, your workforce, but as you as an HR professional, we talked about data science skills, right? Even just opening your mindset to embracing these things, because a lot of times, um, because we don't know how to use it, we don't embrace it. Um, and of course, when you, you don't embrace it, especially if you're a leader, your whole team is not going to embrace it. But you're the, really the one in the way, because your team especially the younger members of your team, the Gen Zs, they are very open to this, you know, very, very, in fact, they're so happy to use these skills. They already have them. They are born, you know, using these skills. So invest in upskilling. We've talked about flexible work. If your firm has the opportunity, right, for flexible work, right, in, there's so many benefits. I think even 
for me, one of the biggest ones is that talent pool. The fact that you can reach talent pools that you would never have dreamed of and that you're no longer restricted to a 30 mile radius. To me, if there's nothing else, I think, you know, I think um, that's one of the ones that to me is just everyone should just look at. So let me hear from you, uh, Elizabeth, you want to take it. What that's not on this list? Yeah. What would be your like any other action plan? What would you be saying to HR professionals? Uh, yeah. So I would say on top of trying to be a data scientist, I would say try and be a decision scientist, the solution scientist. Try and be a what? Sorry, I can't hear you. Decision. You decision yes. and solution mm -hmm. scientist. Yes. And yes. how to do is, first of all, what are the biggest needs for your organization? What are the pain points? What is your business straining under? What is your business going to be straining under in the next three years if you continue the way you are today? Okay. This is what I think a lot of us as HR people need to do to strengthen, build our credibility, build our solution thinking using data, everything. Um, mm. Because if you go and you're proposing remote and hybrid work, but you haven't couched it on the benefits to the business and data is yeah so there's the why are we doing this and then if we do it so what so if you say <laughs> people are not happy okay if i make them happy what will happen yeah what am i going to get so it's the oh, decision boy. scientist and solution yeah. scientist mm -hmm. if you are drilling down into exactly what is the pain point, the immediate pain point, or what will become a pain point if you continue how you did we will then all those, the skills, if you upskill yourself or whatever, you will then know how, how to apply it. Yeah. But if you're upskilling yourself and you're not looking for relevant places to use mm -hmm. it for the business, um, then you will just have a fancy degree. Or something. Yeah. And, and it's interesting you say that because I remember like sometime, I remember, I remember a very angry CEO, um, angry at his CHRO. Uh, who said, um, of course, the reason for uh, staff uh, disengagement was poor salaries and salaries were increased and everyone, you know, <laughs> everyone left, you know, that kind of thing. And the CEO was really happy. Performance didn't improve. And then, you know, people left. So it was a case of, you know, they did, there was no staff who are not happy with salaries so oh, i've increased the salary so and he was expecting that things will change but it yeah. actually went worse yeah. right so sometimes yeah. you you just realize you can't throw money at everything at the problem yeah exactly yeah. yes yeah. um lola your thoughts so i think for me one charge to fellow practitioners is we need to rethink VUCA. I think we've caught on on this whole idea that disruption is a bad thing. But yeah. 2025, there's inevitable disruption coming because if you notice our conversations at the introduction, things are changing, plans are being refreshed. So you yeah. will not be able to probably envisage everything. So, I mean, I think for me, um, one is remember that the speed with which you respond, which yeah. so, yeah, it's volatile, but your response is how quickly are you able to yeah. respond or prepare your organization to respond yeah. to the changes or the shape of shifts that are coming? Um, that yeah. you being uncertain for me is unorthodox. So, and a lot of conversations we've spoken to this evening is there is a different but okay way of doing things. So you can't give people, everyone factory work, uh, flexi time or remote work, but then you have yeah. add-on policies to ensure that that is done. And yeah. the only way you can differentiate really is if you're thinking about what else can I do to make that differentiation. And honestly, looking at the tough economic climate, it is yeah. the level of differentiation and creativity. Yeah. No, you can't, that race to salary increase is a lost one. You can't win it. I know race yeah. to the bottom it is because we need to increase salaries. I was saying to someone, I think it was a webinar recently. And the question yeah. was, if you're asking me to increase salaries, right? Just that's the only right solution you have. It has to be paid yeah. for somewhere. So you're either yes. going to do a headcount reduction, or you remove things around such that your longer RSA, you notice your RSA went down, but your monthly went up. You know, so all those creative things. And then that C is co-create, which is very important. For too long, HR people, our heads are just in a sand pit. 
I can't tell you what I'm doing because that's my competitive advantage. If I tell you, then you take my people. Well, the question is, you have to open your palms to receive. So we actually need to be deliberate about creating communities of practice. You should have, and you and I, we've had this over the years, right? We bounce off ideas of each other and there's no competition there because the minute I'm engaging or discussing, a light bulb is going on for the next big thing. And so the biggest shift would be our mindset changing, that mindset as to what exactly disruption means. And then finally is anticipate. If you're waiting for it to happen, then your response will now, you know, you just kind of come up to respond. You will always be playing catch up. And mm -hmm. your, your MD thing to you to help with that differentiation and that identification for how to remain competitive. So I think for yeah. me to be less rethink VUCA and then of course, emphasize the power of communities of practice, belong to a community and shape engagement. Yeah. So one thing I want to, and this is before I hear from you, Elizabeth, is maybe some of the things we've not addressed in the wider, would I call it the external environment, the political environment, the economic environment. How do you do all this in the face of the economic hardship? I mean, like, are we in a recession or depression? I'm not really um, sure what the economic statistics say, but I remember taking a walk last week Ha, ah, I overheard two drivers speaking in my estates. Ah. So, and one of them said, ah. and the only thing worse than this now war. Ah, and it never bad like this before, you know? And, you know, I was just like, gosh, ah, now war will be the next stage. And I was just like, wow, you know, I mean, it's a state worldwide is, is, is something else, but the Nigerian situation is deep economically. I mean, let's talk about it. How do you, people's mindsets, I'm not even sure they can take this stuff. I mean, it's good that we're talking about it, but where, where in that mix does this come? Because me, when everyone is complaining and talking about people, I always say, you don't know what's doing them because things that people are going through a lot, um, economically, financially, mentally, emotionally. Yeah. How do we manage all that with this? Sorry, Elizabeth, but I just was looking at all of this and I'm thinking about the mindsets of people now. And I'm thinking, because the workforce you're trying to do are, are in an economic rot of sorts, you know? The HR person too is just thinking, look, me, I'm tired. So I'm just trying to put context into it because I know that the world has been going, you know, topsy-turvy uh, in the last, you know, couple of years, especially this last year. Yes, Your thoughts? Yeah. I, I, this is a hard one because... I, I, sorry, all... I can't hear you. Can you speak louder? Okay. I might need yes. to take this off. I said, this is a hard one because yeah. we're all, like, I don't have the answers. What I just know that the world needs more of is empathy. I yeah. think there is the action of empathy that makes people know that we are in this together. We're not HR one function that the class prefects of everybody, the police yeah. or, the, you know, we're human, humaning this thing together. And we can't throw money at every problem because look, we. We will not have a company for us to identify with if we keep doing that, right? Mm -hmm. But where is the proactive? This is the one that I know works for me in like in different things. And I've seen work with leaders who get coaching around it. Coaching is one way where people proactively get to confront issues in that are sort of elevating themselves in their minds you know how something can seem like it's bigger than it is until you yeah. address it and you can walk through it in smoke if we can create with empathy healthy outlets for for this for people to maybe express so that it's not an eruption of an expression when people it's, it's almost like we're in the pressure cooker you know, yeah. see the conversation yeah. we're just talking about. If we don't let out some steam and use our positions as leaders, not just HR people now, and HR, your role here would be if your leaders are not operating in a clued in zone, sort of instigate those types of things, whatever working in your, in your environment. But empathy, 
compassion that makes you act, where people can get conversations, ask questions, give share tips amongst each mm -hmm. other of how they are coping. Because you might not be able to solve it. These communities of practice, there's also communities of problem. So you yeah. can share. And I think it's just if we are thinking that we're human beings together and we're allowing compassion lead us to act and not just like the people wielding the policy or thinking we want to defend the organization. Um, the organization will not exist without people. And if the people also don't... I can't hear the you. Organization, ah, the organization yeah. cannot exist without the people. And the people, if, I, if we're not defending the organization, we will also not have an organization. Yeah, we right. have okay. people. So I think empathy is... Empathy is a big one. Yeah, I guess, you know, definitely. And uh, Lola, so what do you have to say? Final thoughts before we go into Q&A. What are your thoughts? Oh, I quite like what Elizabeth just said now around empathy. And then I would even interface it with that quote that says, um, in a world, if you can be anything, be kind. Too many people are offering these supposed enhancements or improvements in policies. It's, it's attached to something. So come and take these benefits, but you sign here, you do all sorts. So you are saying what should be the organization's empathetic response to the fact that we're all in this together, we're struggling. But while I get that we need to try and make sure the company is not giving it all away, I think we need to be very careful that we're not bringing out these benefits in a quid, quid, quid pro quo manner. Because trust, mm -hmm. trust me, people can see through the sincerity or lack of yeah so i'm giving you a pay increase oh, okay we clap for you is can you in the copy saying we clap for you but what you've done is you've moved things around so my pension has gone down or something yeah or you now yeah. say oh i will pay you this benefit monthly Wait, so just trust yeah. that back to that trust yeah. that openness yeah. you've hired yeah. adults treat adults like adults and let's let's have that empathy so put yourself in the other person's shoes when you're doing things and that applies to how we do the business of hr as well yeah, that's tough. It's a tough one. I think we're going to take questions. I thank you so much, Lola and Elizabeth, for that. We're going to take questions. And while we're waiting for questions, we just want to remind people the registration for the conference ends next week, the 26th. And the conference is on the 3rd and 4th. But we end like, you know, almost a week before to allow us plan. You know what we can be a lot of planning for the annual conference. So registration actually closes next week. So if you haven't registered yet, ensure that you do. Uh, we want to take questions. I'm sure people have questions. I see there's a, quite a lot of us still here. So if you have any questions for Elizabeth, Lola, you know, on what we have discussed, the tech trends, or which ones you uh, want plan to, which you've already embraced, or you have any contributions at all to make to this discussion, that will be very much welcome. I'm looking out for questions um, from anyone. And while we're waiting for questions, you know, if there's anything else, if somebody wants to contribute, that will be welcome as well. So questions, comments. Um, yes. Oh, Rabbi, you've raised. So Rabbi, you want to speak? Let's see. Okay. Can you unmute your mic or let me let me unmute your mic? I saw I've done hand. that. Thank you so much. Okay, fantastic. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, I can. Perfectly. Great. All right. I'd just like to say thank you to all the speakers. It, it's been very, very enlightening. Thanks a lot for the information. And this question goes to Lola, my dear friend and colleague. Mm -hmm. um, Lola, what are your views on remote work from outside the country? Because we still struggle with this. If we say that remote work offers us access to talent, mm -hmm. Um, across the board. What's your view? I know that there's still we still have different schools of thought in terms of how to manage compensation and other legal issues that may arise with conducting remote work from outside the country. Mm. Ravi, good to see you online. And so I'm going to answer this question. It's important I make this disclaimer. I am answering this question as Lola. So you cannot say it is professional ad because you know obviously the work I do means I have to consider that the honest truth is if we agree that work is where the person is and not the location then I don't know why we are having this conversation I'll give you a practical example when COVID started one of my uh, team members she had done this Canada immigration thing and all 
and she wanted to go and okay, no lie, I need to land. There's one flight going, yada yeah. I don't know when this will open. Now, I didn't have any qualms asking her to go because guess what? Over time, this young lady was credible, she was reliable. So I didn't have to see her for my work to get done. She was in Canada the entire period, such that by the time she was ready to come back, she had like six months to go before she qualified for a passport. But my work did not stop. So when it came to how she was paid, remember that the benefit we have in Nigeria is you deduct taxes from source. Unlike other countries where you go and self-assess and then you do your declaration. So for me, it was a question of my work is going on. Yes, she was waking up to do the work. We didn't look for her once. And we're still deducting her money due to Nigerian government and all of that. Now, what I see is on the losing side is actually for the Nigerian government, whereby we now have a lot of Nigerians who are working in US, America, and all of that. And the government is not benefiting from taxes around the work they do. Meanwhile, these organizations abroad are offshoring the work because it allows them not pay the minimum wage in the countries where they're operating. Yeah. So that's something to consider. So I would not really be putting my mind and my for Nigerian companies now on are they available? Was they if they like they should not self-assess and declare their extra income. It's not my problem. And right now, the laws around location. So once upon a time, of course, if you walked 186 days or so it was, your tax yeah. status is determined in that place. But because of remote yeah. work, the concept of a physical location is now void. So I would say tread carefully. I would look for the other things around the contribution, the value the person is bringing. I would explore other contracting arrangements. So maybe, for example, it's not what you having, you're living in Canada, but you're taking a slot that could have gone to a Nigerian. So I would explore other working arrangements. Perhaps can you become a gig worker? So we engage you based on the skills you need. But I would not fight it because, again, this is now one of those times, one of those things that the idea has come. You just need to evolve a way to protect yourself. I mean, let's give a practical example. If this employee was in the UK, for example, they have to pay taxes in the UK. It's not you to pay. They will have to pay taxes in the UK. And for you as an organization, I mean, this is just my thinking, no, Rabbi. If you, we have to recontract a lot of people if we're going to move forward, Okay. And this recontracting is to do with one people working remotely as digital nomads in other countries. There are quite a number of people who have emigrated and have kept their jobs. You know, you have to recontract. You cannot keep the same contract that you had before. It is better they are contract workers or you're contracting them as service workers. Then they sort out their taxes, right? Because they have to pay tax in the country that they are residents. You know, you don't want to take on that headache unless, of course, you have another entity in that other country that employs them. But once they've left the shores of Nigeria, right, you know, they are due, they have to pay taxes in the country they are resident. You can't be in the UK and you're not paying taxes there. It will affect their access to resources in that country, because if they are not taxpayers, why should they be? If they are sick, are they going to run to Nigeria? They're going to. Go to, you know, they'll be on the NHS. So they have to pay taxes there. Yours is, so they need to sort out their taxes or if you employ them there, there. But I would see that there's a lot of recontracting that needs to go on. You can't just close your eyes and you don't know what is happening when you know your employees there. Change their contracts. You know, for me, that's Perhaps the, sim the simplest. The other thing. Yeah. They can't be an employee in Nigeria. They're not working that for they're you. keeping two jobs. Yeah. Because there's also that two jobs yeah and that's why i said what i'm saying is i am speaking as myself and we have to be very yeah. careful because right now our <laughs> policies still say you work for me and you can work for no other but if i shift to a flexi contract or i'm now a consultant yeah. then there is no restriction so it exactly. goes back to your point of recontracting yeah. because you there's some people who have skills that are so good and they're so hard to replace that you cannot imagine the idea of not being them. So again, this is one of those things that forces us to confront the problem yeah. with a different mindset. But if you're looking at it as a problem, they will continue to struggle. If you're in an economy where your job in Nigeria is all they have, they will have to pay taxes yeah. twice. You can't run away from it. If they have another job where they are, honestly, so long as you're doing my work, again, I, I preface <laughs> that this is my view. 
Yeah. So long as you're doing my work, I will not stress you as well. well because at the end of mm. the day, this notion of because you've given me a job, I own you and I own your hours is a dying one. We don't have that leverage anymore. Let's stop kidding ourselves. And I think one of the things that uh, maybe a lot of HR people don't know is that um, if you're working remotely, if you practice hybrid, <laughs> a lot of your staff have two jobs. Don't even deceive yourself. Um, you know, I, I've done quite a bit of recruitment, uh, you know, recently, and I can tell you that, you know, there was a particular role I was recruiting for 90% of the people, they had other jobs and they had no plans of stopping the, their day jobs for this other job. Okay. Of course, these are one of this, this, this can only happen. And not, not and let me make people laugh. It's not that they were always working remotely. Some of them are fully on site somewhere, right? <laughs> but, so don't think that, oh, this is only a remote problem. Like they were looking for remote jobs as the second job. So this affects everyone. And 90% of the people I interviewed for those roles all had jobs and were all on that call trying to convince me how they can do it without, with their own job. And lots of people, you just put them on a different contract. And I know a firm, you know, a firm um, I did some work with last year, they just had to tell everybody, oh, you know, because another um, client was having a problem with people having two jobs. They had lots, you know, a lot of their workers, they found out that they had two jobs. And this other firm, they just had to declare like amnesty, you know, like, okay, if you have two jobs, we're giving you five days or, you know, like one week, come and declare so that we will recontract you. They didn't say, so we will fire you. <laughs> Listen, they said, everybody you have until so, so, so dates to come and declare. I mean, they're highly service technology, right? But they're quite a, you know, a big company. They said, you know, we're giving you like, we're giving you amnesty more or less, come and declare. And, but if we find out ourselves, we will take, disciplinary action, which would probably be termination. But if you know you have come out, declare your second job, we will just change your contract because you cannot be working for two of us. We're not firing you, but we'll just give you a different contract as a contractor because you're not going to be having, taking our pension, right? You know, you can't have your cake and eat it. No, you can't have two jobs and be collecting pension, both sides, no way. They said, we'll recontract you, same terms, but, you know, no benefits like that we give our staff. And yes, people came, you know, and people declared, right? And that was it. And continue business as usual with their performance management systems. If you are slacking in your job and, you know, because you're trying to serve two masters, ah, they just, performance management system will just sweep you out. So these are things, and I think these are some realities that people, we need to <laughs> Whether you like it or not, like I said, some people on this call, I, I saw your staff, who I will not mention. <laughs> your staff came for it to me. It's the truth, right? You know, you think they have full-time jobs. I think we need to accept that these are the realities um, of life. And how do we manage it? I think that's the real question. So do we have any questions? Wait, you know, we just uh, have a few minutes for questions. And... Dara has got her hand up for a while. Who? Sorry? Idara. Okay, Idara, please go ahead. Good evening, uh, everyone. Very great um, session. Um, I mean, it really applies to what I do. So I just wanted to ask, um, so we've seen, we've talked about um, skills-based jobs, skill-based role, right? Um, and how, you know, when we're sourcing for roles that we're look, not looking, necessarily looking for people that have first degrees, you know, and all that, people who have served in Nigeria, how do you balance that out with like the Nigerian labor laws? So because, for example, we've had people come in for interviews and they're like, look, I don't plan to, who have worked with other organizations, possibly like global organizations, and they don't plan to serve, to do um, wow. national youth service, right? And he, they, like the candidate says, look, I blonde, I'll never serve, right? But he had the skills that we needed. So um, a lot of people were having to source for, people in, the, I work in the tech industry, they're having their skills straight from school. Right, so they're, they're, you know, they're having that skill, and you can see comparing them with people that have first degrees. You can't compare it. The, the 
um, gap is quite vast. So how do you, how do we balance that out? Because that's something that I've been thinking of because at that point, my, my um, MD said, look, we're giving him the exemption. So we need him, he has the skills, he's gonna do the job and we give him the exemption. So what, how, what are your thoughts around that? Um, you know, how do we manage that, you know, and all that? I just wanted to. You talk openly. <laughs> I mean, Lola, how do you deal with that? Me, I've so, said contracts already, because oh, I mean, I don't the, see- the, the, law, the law is the law. However, yeah. there are opportunities to now, the only person that gives exemption is yeah. really the Nigerian Youth Service Corps. And the parameters are very clear. Very if you clear. finish uni after 30, so it doesn't matter where you were in the world, though. If you finish yeah. after 30, 30, yeah. Then you are exempted and you can get that exemption. Or if you went to these guys who went to like a long distance school, those correspondence unions, that's the only time. But if you lived abroad, studied abroad, and you finish other 30, you must serve. As to you granting yeah. exemption, You've only delayed the inevitable because yeah. some companies, and I don't I know you remember some of them, yeah. they would hire you because it's convenient to keep you there and you're stuck with them. You really can't move anywhere. Yeah, yeah, so you yeah. think you are benefiting, but in the long run, you are actually eating your future. That's one. Yeah. Now, such an individual can actually work with you. They just cannot be full-time employees as per the provisions, but they can actually go on contracts and contracts. So that covers you from the point of view of ensuring your documentation is okay. So let's balance our wish list yeah. with what is um, legal. Because at the end of the day, you may never get caught. But <laughs> one day, somewhere, somehow, the person yeah. is presenting their papers for appointment or consideration somewhere. And the person says, I worked as so, 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 and so. And then the perception is that your organization is one that enables people. So you could not have granted an exemption. We don't have such powers. Yeah. What it was, was your MD waived the requirement. But I hope you waive that requirement for other people. Otherwise, it should be considered discriminatory because you could have put the person yeah. on a consulting contract and there's no yeah. restriction. Your consultant the person has skills that you yeah. want. Until the person regularizes the employment, then they get full-time yeah. uh, on-tenured yeah. employment, at least for now. That's what we do in Nigeria. Yeah. And your, your, your MD cannot waive it. It's not his to waive, right? That he wants to do it is a different matter. He can't waive the law, right? He, he wants to break it. It's a different case altogether. But to me, the issue is contracting, right? And this thing of, we need to know that there are different types of contracts and everybody must not be an employee. And that person also must have made a decision. Maybe they don't want to be an employee. To me, it sounds like once it's, it's somebody says, I'm not going to serve, what are they saying? Inevitably, they're saying, I don't want employment in Nigeria. We need to also balance it. That person does not want an employment contract because it can't be you they, they want to put in trouble. They don't want an employment contract. So why do you want to hire them as an employee? They want to be a gig worker. They've said it, they've declared openly, right? Then do that. They, you can't have your cake and eat it. They can't want employment and not want to serve in Nigeria because in Nigeria, it's a requirement. So for me, your short-term solution is to put them on, on, a, on a contract and then and also obviously find out the ambitions of this person. They don't have plans to work in any, would I say, compliant organization. They don't. And they don't have plans for a typical career because a typical career is dead anyway. We've said it. So get used to this kind of employment, not for employment, of contracts. Let me put it that way. There's a shift. And this is obviously one of them because if you want people with skills if you're going to hire people to work outside the you know there are lots of us who work with people who are outside the country who do our tech for this is the same type of person they have skills did you employ them no so let's focus on those kind of things thank you i, I don't know whether elizabeth wanted to say anything on that maybe we have like five minutes or... Oh no! This you, you just answered it. This you don't yeah. you can't give a typical Nigeria yeah. full time employment contract. Yeah. You you can hire them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think you have a question from me, Ijoma, right? So still on the shift from academic or other qualifications to skill. How do we as HR professionals begin to implement changes in recruitment policies that have minimum qualifications criteria? I want to believe that some of those minimum criteria would be like degree, 
right? How do we, yeah, I mean, these are, this, that's a valid question, <laughs> change in policy. It's inevitable, Ola. The, the question, Elizabeth, do you want to take that? How do we, will companies change their policies? It's the, so the, so the thing, what they, they, yeah, so we're giving you advice and we're telling you that whether or not you are positioned for it right now, we're getting to the point where, in fact, we were already at the point where it's not what you studied at school that you were working with. I know people who studied medicine and then they became um, photographers and they're making money. I know people who studied industrial chemistry and uh, bank MDs. So we already started that shift and then we yeah. somehow regressed where we would say in the job description, and we want someone, we're hiring for the HR and we're like qualifications in this and that a social science subject is recommended. Those are types of things mm -hmm. you can do. It's within your power. What does that add? Just ask the question. What does qualification in a social science um, course, whatever add degree, mm -hmm. add to the job, to the skills that the person has to deploy? Mm -hmm. Questions. Um, I didn't study IT or programming, but I, I worked for two years as a programmer. I learned it in, in a crude way. So <laughs> in a crude way. <laughs> yeah. These are things. Like if you are designing your job descriptions, you have to figure out what exactly do you want that person to do. Skills-based hiring means defining what exactly they have mm -hmm. to be able to do. And do these things you spelt out in there as the requirements, qualification requirements, do they actually mean that they can do it? Yeah. If you can answer that question, that's it. So if you have a policy that says for the person to work in, if it's relevant to the role and it gives them the real hands-on skills, then, then that's fine. But if it doesn't, that's an opportunity for you to optimize and change yeah. your policy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we just use degree as a barrier to entry, like for roles, because it's obvious that quite a number of roles, you know, that we even recruit at degree level don't even need degrees in, you know, in a normal way. But I think, I guess it's a bit complex in terms of if, if depending on the level, the educational system and the quality of, of that degree, but we definitely have to have that shift when it comes to uh, it's it's skill based whether we like it or not you know and we will see more and more of that when when candidates start to pass on you know those jobs and not want to take them and when hiring becomes even more difficult because the talent pool is very interesting you know? it's um the last you said 6 million that's not a lot you know, how many SMEs are there? Maybe there's the same number of companies that are looking for people than are even available to do the work. The talent pool is, is not a lot within, if we're not thinking remote. The only thing I can add to that um, talent pool of 6 million is remote workers. Yeah, because I'm thinking, okay, the guy who works on our website is in Pakistan also, yeah, or India. I don't even know where he is. That's it. That's what's going to help with that you know talent pool the talent pool is very small in a lot of african countries whether we like it or not because it's not that we have people because what is the value in people is the skill set isn't it human capital is skills human resources is a different labor is a different thing but human capital and labor are not the same because it's that refinement and we have we definitely have a gap a big gap there. So I think let's take uh, maybe one last question. Um, okay, no, I don't see any other questions. So I think, you know, with um, that, if we don't have any, let me see, is anybody's hands up? If we don't have a last question, we can call it a, can someone check? Just trying to see, no hand up, yeah. So I think that was a great conversation. Um, I, I mean, I definitely learned a lot. So we learned about those talent shifts that we need to embrace now not the ones that we need to embrace tomorrow. Um, just if you remember, okay, sorry. Oh, Elizabeth, you wanted to say I something? Found one. No, yeah, I saw a question <laughs> from Claudette, Claudette Russell. Yes, yes, go ahead. She says, what tools or software are recommended to support hard working 
to monitor and measure and help build trust. Ah, this one. Okay, okay, good. I didn't even I see scrolled. that. I scrolled. Maybe I've scrolled. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Elizabeth, you answer. <laughs> oh, really? I was going to allow my mom to answer. Okay, well, you both answer. So here, yes. there are simple things that people use that don't... Um, I'm going to focus on the question about building trust. Yes, yes. I'm not monitoring because mm -hmm. the need to monitor what they're doing shows that there's a lack of trust. And that's probably what you need to take care of first in terms of going to deal with whatever culture you need in terms of your people being trustworthy and disciplined, knowing that they have to, and then your leaders trusting. But say you want way that people can be productive remotely what tools can help with collaboration and all of that there are many in fact you can if you are microsoft office based you can already use microsoft teams without going yeah. to get another I, i'm all for um optimizing without spending because that we have lots of tools and we don't use them to full capacity like we don't utilize them enough and then we go and get singular use cases and one. we just have so many tools for singular things um if you have microsoft office sharepoint somebody can build like an the water cooler for you where people can track if you already use slack that's a beautiful way i've seen organizations that use Slack and create different channels for different things in fact there's a leave channel in one of the companies where i'm fractional where or away from desk if you're going to be away just go and drop your message you're not going to leave but you just have to step away from your desk so that people who are collaborating with you and need to find you don't look for you if they see that you have that tag away from desk then they know okay we'll check back um there are different there are different things some people use trello boards there are some that are cheap we use notion um, in my organization, and then we have Google Suites, you know, where they, the chat rooms, we can see who's active, how long you've been active, and all of that. Yeah. And if you're away, we can tell. It's more about looking for what exactly are you trying to exactly. So Viva also helps. And if you if you use your Microsoft Teams, there are different add-ins and uh, plugins and add-ons that you can go and just yeah. click and subscribe to. And if you find that you're not using it well, you can stop subscribing. Mm. But yeah, I mean, it's more yeah. about the culture. It's about the behavior. Because if you have the tool and you don't, it's garbage in, garbage out. If nobody, if people yeah. don't know that if you go there and log in, they won't. So it's about driving the culture and then use the tool to support. Yeah. And I think, you know, of course, because of, for work, for work like HR, that can be done remotely because of the nature of the work. I can see how, or any kind of role, I can see how the talent pool will be further depleted because I know like I've recruited for a couple of roles recently and you know, some people's inquiry was, is it fully remote or hybrid? And the minute you say fully on sites, crickets, you don't hear from them again. Like, you know, wouldn't consider it especially when they're already working in a hybrid ah i think it's hard it's for someone to move from hybrid to fully on site mm -mm. it's hard i think it's, it's easier to obviously make the shift the other way around so that talent pool will be further you will be restricted because some people the only reason why they won't take that job is because it's fully on site especially when they have ripped the benefits of the flexibility from you know hybrid work i'm you know and i think for me i mean everybody's different but i i believe hybrid is is better than fully remote too i mean fully remote might be inevitable but i think just like we said 2025 we will start seeing studies on the effect of fully remote fully remote is not you know <laughs> it has its challenges and i think we will start seeing a lot of the data come out on fully remote it's not a normal way to function being on your desk chatting all day for life you have to be deliberate about your well-being and getting up so i, I you know you, that it doesn't only come with tech investment 
Remote work comes with well-being investment as well. And I'm sure a lot of the firms who are doing fully remote, if you don't balance it out with well-being measures, you're going to have, you know, I, I'm seeing some well-being results coming up um, on people who work fully remote because some people are not able to be social at all. And they're going into depressive states from not having or not working or not collaborating effectively remotely than if they were in the office. So that's a whole different area anyway, but I just thought I'd mention. So I think we've come um, to the, I would say we've come to the end. I just want to thank everyone uh, for their time. Yes, hybrid works well. And you, know, I want to just remind everybody about the conference, 3rd to 4th December. We're looking forward to receiving you and we're looking forward to sharing more insights. A lot of the things that we've talked about are still the same things we're going to go into further detail on. On day one, of course, we have quite a number of panel sessions talking about issues such as the gig economy, talking about well-being, you know, talking about resilience, all sorts of topics. If you look at the website, then you'd see all the detail. And then, of course, on day two, we have master classes on data analytics, AI, you know, these different areas, even on career transitions outside of HR, because, you know, people are coming into HR, people are maximizing and excelling in HR, but some people, I think you might be thinking of what next after HR. So you can watch out for our master classes on that, um, because, you know, this is something that we've been looking forward to, and also it's our 15th year anniversary. So we're really looking forward to everyone. Check the chat, the conference link is there. Have a good evening. We'll see you in less than two weeks. I think it's about 10 days to go. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Lola. Always a pleasure. Lovely banter. Good conversation. All the audience, great. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.